Good afternoon. Welcome to our Cultivating Learning session today, Cultivating Environmental Leaders. Um, I see some of you are already introducing yourselves in the chat. Hi, Erin, and thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Philip Harapaport, the lead for education and engagement at the Smithsonian Office of Educational Technology, which is a central education office at the Smithsonian and the office behind the Smithsonian Learning Lab. I'm joined today by Jennifer Brundage, who is the National Outreach Manager at Smithsonian Affiliations. Jennifer works with colleagues across the Smithsonian Institution, as well as the Smithsonian's affiliated partner museums nationwide on a collaborative education program, Earth Optimism, Youth Action and Leadership. So the image you see on the right side of the slide shows a group of students that Jennifer worked with. In this case, they're outside interacting directly with an American Kestrel. And that program led the students uh, to build and distribute birdhouses on their school campus. So in our session today, Jennifer will talk about this place-based and project-based program and the strategies that they've been using to empower young environmental change makers by instilling hope, encouraging positive action, and promoting solutions. You'll leave today with resources and models to inspire the youths in your life and work, to advocate for sustainability, and to embrace their vital roles in their communities. This is an ongoing and highly inspiring program started in 2019 that reflects work in communities across the country. And in fact, Jennifer and the team um, at the Earth Optimism Youth Action and Leadership Program were recently awarded the 2023 One Smithsonian Education Award and deservedly so. So a few logistics. Uh, before we dive in, this we would love for this to be as interactive as possible. So please feel free to share your comments in the chat. If you're joining us by YouTube, you can see that over on the far right hand of your screen. And if you're joining us through Facebook, it's in the center bottom of your screen. Um, let's see what else. You're already introducing yourselves. That's awesome. Thank you so much for coming. And this is a screenshot of the homepage of the Learning Lab. The Learning Lab is a free online platform where you can discover digital museum resources from across the Smithsonian, create interactive learning experiences with them, and share your discoveries and creations with others. So we'll be sharing resources today in the Smithsonian Learning Lab. Any links that we share can be found in a companion Learning Lab uh, collection that we created for this session. And I'll just put that link in the chat here. We'll also add that link to the um, description for today's archived video. Want to draw your attention also to our educator page so you can access that from the bottom of any screen in the Learning Lab by clicking on Get Started. And that's where you can find step-by-step -step instructions for anything you need to do in the Learning Lab, um, access our YouTube videos, and also access all of our um, live or archived uh, PD professional development sessions. Okay. Reminder that this session will be recorded. And as I said, the session today, uh, you can find it from our help page and we've split it into chapters so you can easily find the section that you're looking for. So we'll be talking today about what is earth optimism, place-based learning, project-based action planning, and finally taking action and inspiring peers. We like to start the session off by throwing out a question to the audience to get everyone talking. And so today's question is, what makes your place, school, campus, neighborhood, city, or town unique? What do you love about it? And I'll turn it over to Jennifer. Philippa, thank you so much. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Um, 
as I told Philippa earlier, these are this is my favorite topic, talking about young people taking climate action. So I'm excited. I'm excited to spend um, the next hour with you. And I see that there's I have lots of kindred spirits in the audience um, who are doing this kind of work already. I'm anxious to have a, a discussion with you and share strategies um, and see what you love about where you live. So um, as as we think about that, we'll come back to the chat um, so we can learn a little bit more about where everybody's coming from and what you what you like about where you live, the diversity, the diversity of Chicago, that's for sure. Um, also the architecture of Chicago is pretty wonderful, I would say. <laughs> that's great, it's about the people of Chicago. I wonder if somebody else has a comment they'd like to share. Philippa, what's what's your favorite place? What makes your place unique? You know, I love living in DC and having access to Rock Creek Park. I just Aha. love it. Aha. This view near a huge bridge that, you know, is this main artery into the downtown of DC, but you can also get to these quiet places right under uh, the bridge. So true. Access to nature, very important. I see Aaron, as I noticed earlier, is from my hometown of Boulder. Um, so like you, she has trails right outside her back door. Um, giant sequoias bring together people in awe. I love that comment. Thank you. So let's go to the next slide because, you know, there's a saying that as long as you have something to love, you have something to hope for. And that's what Earth Optimism is really all about. It's about using authentic hope and focusing on solutions. And so, you know, so much of what we hear in the media about climate change is really doom and gloom. And that is not inspiring for people um, to take action. It's just, it's scary um, and it can be depressing and overwhelming. And so Earth Optimism is an attempt to flip that script to one of hope and uh, promise and really, Part of that is about focusing on solutions that are realistic and actionable. We know that there are thousands of solutions at every scale taken by everyone all the time to make the planet um, healthier and more sustainable. And so it's important in Earth Optimism to focus on that, regardless of where you live, how old you are, um, or the kind of environment you're in, and then to share that those solutions and your actions very broadly so that you can inspire others. The idea that, you know, if a 12th grader in Miami can do this, then so can a that so can a high school student in Idaho. That kind of thing. So um, in the next slide you'll see another, you know, another benefit to um, rooting this program in Earth Optimism. And I, I'm curious if others have kind of experienced this or heard about this. We hear from psychologists that there's a rise in eco anxiety uh, uh, among young people, which is not surprising, right? If you're under 30 years old, you've you've kind of always lived your whole life with the background of climate change, um, uh, backgrounding your, your, what you hear on the news and maybe what is being talked about and, and as the, the weather events are happening and even, right, as these challenges um, get, increase over time. And so what they also tell us, what the research also shows, is that the best anecdote to that kind of eco-anxiety is agency and action and leading with hope and realizing that you are not alone in these fears, but you're also not alone in, in addressing them. Um, you do have the agency and the power to, to make change. Um, and so that's what this program is all about. And I want to show you on the next, so what you're seeing here are pledges um, that people wrote on, um, you know, on Earth Optimism cards at our last Earth Optimism Summit a few years ago. Um, everything from plan greener spaces to um, use less plastic to spend more time outside and uh, you name it, all kinds of things. And this is the whole point. There are an infinite number of solutions we can all take. So on the next slide, you'll see what Earth Optimism looks like when it's activated. Uh, this is a group of students in Baltimore and you can see this is post pandemic, right? So they come back to their school. They have a 
big courtyard with a greenhouse. It was overrun with um, weeds. It hadn't been, you know, cleaned. There was some litter back there. Their greenhouse was a mess. A lot of things had been dumped. And so despite that, uh, they showed up on a wintry morning, <laughs> wintry day, a rainy day with um, some adult mentors who you can see there, some local farmers and other adult mentors. And I wish, I wish you could see this school now. It is blooming. Um, there's, you know, we did a lot of weeding. It's overgrown with pollinator plants. They've planted birdhouses. They created a pizza garden. Um, and if you, right, this is, where students plant um, in in uh, raised beds, they plant basil, tomatoes, peppers, jalapeno, and so we all celebrated with their their harvest at the end of the semester. And the greenhouse is a place where they have carved out to be a place of respite, a place where they can go and decompress sometimes from the stress of school, and they've really made it their own. So this is what's possible um, when students feel that they have this this power to change their environments. So on the next slide, you'll see um, this is the program, of course, that we're talking about today. Um, as Philippa said, it's project and place based. So we'll get a little bit into that. But we focus on, you know, what do students value about? We do this, the same things that we ask you. What do you value about where you live and what do you know about it? Right. Often, as we'll explore a little bit later, you know, we take for granted sometimes the features and, and the built infrastructure around us without questioning it. So what do they know about it? And, and what are they observing about how it's changing over time? You know, is it snowing less or is it snowing earlier or is it warmer in different parts of the month? Is it flooding more? These are the things that we'd like them to start thinking about. And then kind of probing what are they concerned about and what might we do about those things? But the overriding message of this program is really to bolster young people's identity as change makers, the change makers that they inherently are and the catalysts that they can be for change in their communities. So we do this with classroom teachers. We do it in out of school time, after school or as summer programs. And we do this in collaboration, as uh, Philip has said, with our affiliated partners across the country. So let me just stop here and see before we go to chapter one, if there's any questions or comments. I'm gonna to look to you, Philippa. To, if I have been so enjoying following you that I haven't <laughs> been keeping up as much. Um, so going back, people were talking about what they appreciated. I think we did not mention Idaho's outdoors as described by four-time governor and President Carter, Secretary of the Interior, as our second paycheck. Um, Whitney says, I work at a national heritage corridor that runs through many urban settings, but allows access to trails and nature through five counties. Um, and then other people are saying where they're from. I don't awesome. think we have any questions, but okay. I do encourage people to read through. They're really great. I'm also seeing some art educate an art educator in in the audience. I'm thrilled to see that. We'll we'll touch on that a little bit earlier, or a little bit later. Okay, so with the next slide, let's just jump in. Um, you know, as good educators, we like to meet students where they are, very literally and figuratively. This is a group of teenagers at sunrise. Imagine how hard that was in Wyoming. Um, and they're studying the behavior of the sage grouse, which is an endangered species on the grasslands, so that they can work to start thinking about how to protect the habitat of the sage grouse. And on the next slide, you'll see a more urban example. These are students in Arkansas um, at one of our affiliated partners um, studying pollinator plants. Um, what kinds of plants are they? What kind of pollinators are they seeing there? You can see that they're using doing some authentic data. So one thing to remember as we approach this, depending on the kinds of students that you work with, is that nature, uh, you know, I, as I see in the, in the chat, like we all value nature, right? I uh, saw so references to trails and sequoias, but nature, we can't take for granted that it's, it's safe or kind of normal for everyone, depending on the kinds of students that you serve. So um, for some, their local park may not be a safe place to hang out. For others, 
um, there might be some trauma associated with being outside, depending on how they got to where they are, or depending on historical um, precedents, uh, culturally or otherwise, that prohibit them from enjoying or being able to uh, be outside without some anxiety. So an important part of, of this program, of course, because it is about the environment, is creating safe places outside. And doing the kinds of activities that make students recognize what we do here in the chat, that nature is a place for respite, that it is that place for decompression. Because that, that bond, right, strengthening that bond with nature is also another step toward helping to preserve those places that we care about. So we're going to take you through a couple of the activities that we do, and I hope that you'll join us. Um, with this. So the first one about uh, that we use in exploring place is really about using all five senses. So please do this with us. Think back to what you put at the beginning about your favorite place and what you love about it. We'll just take a minute. You know, we usually have students come outside, sit on the ground, which is, you know, that too sometimes takes a little bit of convincing <laughs> that it's okay to do that. Um, but think about it's a five, four, three, two, one activity. So think about five things in your mind's eye now that you see in that place you love. And four things that you hear. And three things that you might feel or touch. Two things that you can smell wherever you are. And then something that Perhaps you don't taste, but you could taste what that might taste like. Okay, so if you go, if we go to the next slide, you'll see what this looks like in practice. Um, taking a bunch of students outside. Now remember, this is right at their high school. This is outside of a hallway that they pass every single day. They go through this courtyard every single day. But this activity, all of a sudden, guess what kind of observations we heard? Oh, wait, wow, birds, I hear birds, I hear insects, I can feel the wind blowing on my face. I didn't realize the ground was so dry, right? So all of a sudden, there's a different kinds of appreciation of, of these places that, that we pass through every day without even thinking about it. And you can see on the left, a student is pulling out a plant that she was able to identify that she had never seen before in that courtyard. So this is again, that idea of um, helping students to appreciate what's around them that maybe they may be, you know, just walking through it uh, or walking past every day. And what we also hear with this activity is just what we've been mentioning here, how calming it is to be outside and to listen for those things and how necessary that kind of break is from the stress of school. So uh, in the next slide, we'll show um, another activity that's a, a little bit of a version of this that brings in some interdisciplinary aspects of examining place. And that is thinking about the geography of your place, what's unique about that, um, who are the people, you know, how many students in your, in your orbits can name the mayor of their town or the city council. Um, or, you know, the different kinds of leaders, community leaders, um, or the kinds of cultures that might be in your town. And that speaks to the culture um, also of where you live. What does that mean? A lot of students don't understand that term, that it can mean, um, you know, the way people dress. It could mean the kind of music tradition. It could mean the kind of diversity, as we heard in Chicago. How, how might we describe the culture of Chicago, for example? And then the history of a place. How did it come to look this way in the first place? So in this example, I'm gonna show you on the next um, slide. I did this recently with a, a high school class in rural Montana, practically to the Canadian border. And we went around and we were talking about all these different aspects. And I learned that the river in their town is really what gave way to the name of that town. Um, and I won't reveal it, but anyway, um, and so we started talking about the river and how the students, do they enjoy that river? What do they do on that river? Oh, I, you're right, they went, uh, they couldn't stop telling me about how much they love the river. They swim in it, they fish in it, uh, they tube and raft in it in the summertime, they take picnics by it, they play football by their river, they love their river. 
And I said to them, that is so awesome because, you know, in my hometown of Washington, I can't swim in my river. And they gave me this so they couldn't understand what I meant by that. Like, do you, uh, do you not know how to swim? Well, yes, I do know how to swim, but in Washington, my river is polluted and I can't, I can't go in it. Um, and this was a concept to them that, right, they, it was very difficult to, to conceive of how, how a river could get so polluted that it would not be swimmable or usable. Now, granted, we're working very hard on our rivers in DC, but it opened up for me an opportunity to talk to them about what does pollute a river? So we had just gone through this activity and you told me about the industries that are north of you and the farms that all are, are all around you that may be using pesticides. So we can talk about how watersheds work, how those chemicals that waste gets into waterways. We can talk about how pollution makes its way with extreme storms and other things through storm drains and all that kind of stuff. So this opens up a different kinds of conversation about the those things that they may not have put together that actually can infect can impact the the health of the places that they live and love and recreate. And then subsequently what they can do to help preserve those places. So at this point in our program now that we know a little bit about what students care about, what they're concerned about, this opens up a door to creating very intentional field trips. So example, for example, um, if you go to the next slide, you can see a bunch of students in Everglades National Park. So if students are really interested in the birds that they're hearing, but they don't know how to identify them, for example, um, or you know, we work with a lot of students who don't know the term or, or ornithologists, or they've never used binoculars before. Um, they don't know what's migrating over their town or how to protect those migrating birds, um, for example. So these are the kinds of field trips that you might want to set up. Um, or you might want to think about some non-traditional places to go on a field trip. For example, a compost yard, a landfill, um, an urban farm, uh, you know, lots of students are interested in food waste, perhaps a solar company, all kinds of things that um, can help students see the real world implications and who else in their community is working on the issues that they care about. This is also an opportunity. As we're talking about this, I'm also thinking about leadership. So this is also an opportunity for them to do authentic um, research so um, there's lessons here to be had about how do we know what we know? Um, how can we spot misinformation and disinformation? Um, what is an inter informational interview and how do you do that? And you know, it's important for us to introduce these students from an environmental justice point of view to people in the community who are doing this work who look like them. Um, so I'll stop here again. This is the kind of the end of this section and just get a little temperature check about where we are. Uh, so we've had some really nice comments coming in. Uh, Natalia talked about she did the 54321 exercise for her workplace. Ah. So she saw she sees uh, four coworkers, one phone. She can hear the webinar and fan, the computer fan, office chatter and people walking. Um, what's next? Touch uh, her keyboard and desk and paper, and she can smell uh, peanut butter and apple. Oh, uh, I love that. I love this like song. You can, really, you can really feel it, right? Uh, Gloria had two comments. Uh, she says, nature connected and environment earth is part of a different kind of empathy of people right. and place. And then she that. follows up to say, following up on a previous post leading to introduction of lesson plan, arts and sciences and ecosystem to create art and project-based learning. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Right, we're gonna get into action planning and how um, actions, ac projects, action projects can take lots of forms, including art. Great, um, actually, th so that Natalia also asks a question, how do I balance preparation for a program 
and curiosity ba curiosity based learning and intentional field trips? That's a really good question because what we're talking about, of course, is um, uh, letting the students lead a little bit, which is a challenge sometimes for planning. Um, and you know, uh, we have the advantage of being informal educators um, at the Smithsonian, and so we partner with um, uh, formal educators so that we're in in collaboration. We can offer some things that perhaps are a little bit outside of curriculum. So. I think that if you're able to um, kind of factor in a collaboration or something that might give a little bit of flexibility um, so that other educators in your community can help fill some of those curiosity gaps that perhaps you can't for one reason or another, um, because you're <laughs> because you have standards and um, a curriculum that you need to get through. I think that there's a nice pairing there. And so um, in addition to the affiliates that we pair with, uh, that we collaborate with across the country, we're also working with high school teachers from coast to coast. Um, and in this way, we're able to supplement and complement what they do in the classroom or after school. Great, thank you, Jennifer. There, there's one other question that came in from Calaveras Big Tree State Park. Uh, and the question is, practically speaking, what's the timeline in your program from the Thought Bubble experiment to a related field trip? Um, I'd say, you know, it's about a month. Um, you know, there's a lot of some, uh, you know, while you're planning that field trip, again, we're, we're informal educators. And so we have a lot of um, flexibility and autonomy. And, you know, at the Smithsonian, we have the benefit of having a transportation <laughs> department that can help us with buses and things like that. So I know those are challenges in different communities, but, um, that time between the thought bubble and when you go on a field trip, you can be doing certain things like data collection. So for example, um, we'll take a bird example. Our team recently had students taking nets just like entomologists do, which is another great word for students to know. Um, and taking samples of insects, gathering insects from different parts of their campus where the grass is mowed, where it's next to uh, you know, a forest in higher grass that hasn't been mowed. And so that kind of data collection shows the biodiversity of insects in a particular kind of landscape and also the quantity. Um, and all of those things are kind of prep work, kind of those kind of activities that can preface um, a field trip so that when they actually go to an aviary or to um, another kind of place like that, they can see. Um, another very popular activity that we do, for example, if students are interested in food waste, we see this a lot. Um, before we go to the urban farm, before we go to the compost yard, we'll do a waste audit, um, which is, is crazy fun, right? Because you get to wear the special gloves and you're going through trash. And so it's gross, but also fun. And you can get a lot of data that you can then use um, to, to make a case for why your schoolmate need a compost program as, a, as an example. So in the learning lab collection, which we'll go over later, we've got lots of ideas for these kinds of activities that can fill in that time between um, when they express kind of an interest in something and when you're taking them out to meet folks and, and go to places to fill in those gaps. All right, so with the next slide, We'll go on um, and now it's time to act. So we asked all of our students to come up with a slogan. Um, oh yeah, food waste is my go-to. Oh, that speaks to my heart. Anyway, we've asked all of our students to come up with a, a tagline for this program. And it was it, they, they came up with it very quickly and it's very simple. Change requires action. So yes, it's important to build students' environmental literacy, but without action, we're missing a critical piece of, of what's required, frankly, um, as, as a global community to address the problems that we're facing. So there's many ways to go about this. I'm going to describe um, uh, our way, but of course, in the Learning Lab, I can point you to other resources too. We always encourage the students to work in groups and not individually. This helps them, well, first of all, it's project-based, 
they're learning by doing. And this helps them build their project management skills. So in the next slide, you'll see. Um, so we have a group of students here using this guide. So this is the guide that we use, an environmental action planning outline. Um, we are not the only ones who produce this. There are many kinds of action planning guides out there. Um, sometimes they're called project charters. Sometimes they're called um, group planning documents. But basically, this takes students step by step through a project man management process. So you're asking them to identify you know, what is the issue that you're concerned with? Um, what are your goals for your solution? Who are the stakeholders? This is a great time to introduce students to the idea of a stakeholder. Who needs to give permission? Who will benefit from this? Um, and then what are the specific actions you're going to take? And what do they cost, quite frankly? Um, and what resources do you need to do that? And finally, we ask them to think about evaluation. How will you know if your solution is um, impactful if it's working if it's making a difference so these this is an example here's on the left you can see the template which we have made available in the learning lab and also one in in progress so what i love about this kind this process the this this part action planning as you can see on the next slide um, is that it it helps students um, it, it gives them the opportunity to practice all kinds of skills effective brainstorming also interdisciplinary skills like creating a budget brings in math skills, creating timelines for when they're gonna do this action is all about time management. Um, we ask them to justify how they came up, well, how do they know what they know? How did they come up with this solution and why did they think it would work? That's based on research and data collection. Um, of course, for Earth Optimism, a big point for us is communicating what they're doing. So what is their communication plan? You know, it gives us an opportunity to talk about things like what is an elevator pitch um, and how do you develop one? Do you need a press release? Do you need a spokesperson on the team? Um, and so you can see here a group of students um, doing a brainstorm about possible solutions. Um, we, you, you know, you're also looking at group dynamics and teamwork, such as negotiation, um, collaborating with each other, group decision making. And on the next slide, you'll see that in our program, we always ask the students to present their action plans. Um, and this is very scary for them, but it's really worth it. Um, this gives them an opportunity to create a presentation together and to work on their public speaking skills. And so the kinds of folks that you might have them speak to, of course, are decision makers. So this could be, again, student government or faculty or um, a combination of uh, faculty and administrators. It might be other community members. Um, it could be, you know, folks who might um, provide some funding for the students, uh, or it could be a range of those things. And so, in our, we we come up with, we have a series of criteria and questions that we ask students to address as part of their presentation, and and we'll share that with you in the learning lab collection. But I also you know, just want to mention that we we try to also encourage best practice with project management, and that is thinking about smart goals. Um, and on the next slide, you can see the rubric that we give to, um, in our case, a jury of uh, various professionals who are looking at student projects. So we're, um, you know, we're looking at the clarity of the the presentation. Is it or is it well organized? Does it um, makes sense, right? Does that solution actually match uh, the problem that they've identified? Um, have they done the proper research? Do they really understand the root causes of the problem that they're trying to address and how the solution will directly affect it? Do they Are they incorporating SMART goals, which are right specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, time-bound, and in our case, we include accessible to a lot of people, inclusive, many voices were consulted, and just. Do they know who this benefit, who the, what this solution is, who it's going to benefit? Um, and then, you know, again, is the budget accurate? Does it make sense? You know, sometimes we have students thinking that a can of paint costs $1,000. 
So there's some, right, there's some <laughs> tweaking that has to happen here, right, so that they, so that they can understand that their solutions are uh, realistic and achievable. And I just want to give an example here of why these kinds of criteria are so important. We worked with a student group um, uh, last year that was very interested in ocean acidification. Clearly, ocean acidification is a huge problem. It's, um, you know, it's killing coral, it's affecting wildlife and, and, and marine life. But it's a little big for a student group in high school in Maryland to take on. Um, and so we had to break that down a little bit about what are the root causes of ocean acidification? What contributes to that problem? And when you break it down a little bit more and you identify the various pieces, you can see one of the uh, causes, of course, is carbon emissions and how we get to school. And so that is a much more realistic and um, fee feasible kind of problem to, to attack than ocean acidification. It's just like, how can we encourage our peers to get to school in different ways? To bike to, do we have a bike to school day? Um, can we walk together? Can we come up with a better carpool program? Um, these kinds of things make it, you know, do we need uh, bike racks if, if we're going to do that? How do we survey our peers to see what their options might be? What kinds of incentives might we build in for people who take alternative track transportation? to school rather than filling up our parking lot every single day. So that's how, you know, adult mentors can come in at all different points of this process, not only faculty, but of course, your the informal educators around you, the conservation organizations and their educators around you can come in and help students kind of ground their solutions in, uh, in reality and feasibility. So yeah, it's scary, but, um, it builds a lot of self-confidence. Uh, and th those are the kinds of comments we get after students go through this process that I didn't know I could do it. I didn't know I could manage a project like that. And I really enjoyed working with my peers. And I feel a sense of accomplishment that I'm seeing changes um, in my school or my community. So I'll stop here because this is the end of this. Um, Section. Yeah, you know, we have one question from Gloria, but why don't we hold it till the end of the next session? I mean, till the okay, you know, yeah, we'll come back to that question, Gloria. Okay, so the final section is really about how do we make sure now, now we're into execution, now we have to make these projects happen. How do we make sure everyone on the team has an opportunity to shine? And so, this is um, a Venn diagram that I love to use when it comes to the point of um, how do we make sure that everybody on the team has a role that fits them? So we ask students, you know, you might put in climate action, okay, what is the project we've decided to do? Well, thinking about yourself, what brings you joy? What do you love doing? Um, on the bottom left, what are you good at? What skills do you bring? What networks do you have to bring to the table? And then what kind of actions need doing? And this helps to, um, right, not everybody on the team needs to do everything for the project. Uh, you're going to have some students who are on the yearbook staff and they make great documentarians because they have a great camera. You have others who love to write. You have others who, you know, um, are kind of excited by public speaking. Maybe they're doing your public service announcements. Others might be um, doing social media. Others are great tinkerers or like to have their hands um, in the dirt or, or like to move and be active as part of the thing. So um, this is really an opportunity for everyone on the team to, uh, to, do it, to do what they do, but to bring their best selves to the project. And if you look on this, the next slide, you can see this Venn diagram kind of fleshed out a little bit. This is a, a product of Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, who's a marine biologist an author and a climate activist. And I love this because it's not only, right, it's not only good for this specific purpose. It's good for students to think about themselves in the longer term as environmental citizens and climate activists, because we're more inclined to continue taking action if it's aligned with our values and what we already love doing. And there's so much to be done. And this is the point that we can make to students that to work in climate, or to have a job in the green sector, you don't need a PhD in science. You can be an artist or a writer. Um, you can 
install solar panels. You can, right? No matter what you're good at or what interests you, there's a place in the environmental movement for you. And not just a place, there's a need in the environmental movement for the talents that you can bring. And that's, right, I think this, this is a point at which, right, even if students don't go into a green job, although we do think that that sector is gonna expand in future years, even if they don't, they have the confidence and the knowledge to make the kinds of decisions that are sustainable, regardless of what job that they go into. And so I'll just show you quickly some examples of what this looks like, some action projects that have been executed in our experience. You can see a group of students um, who love to create, to, to build bird boxes and install them on their campus. They installed 10 of them, and you can see they've installed them around their rain garden, which they also planted. Um, some creative students in Miami um, created this flyer for a beach cleanup, and another person on the team who loves to network uh, went to the school that's on the other side of the beach and encouraged them and recruited them to come out and help them so that they uh, were able to do this together. On the next slide, um, you can see a great writer from Montana who's writing articles for the state's Environmental Information Center. Um, we worked with a team in Anchorage, Alaska, who had an artist on it who loved to create logos. So she created a logo for their summit and for their composting program and for their after school group. Um, so she really got to take her graphic design skills um, and put them to good use. And on the last slide, uh, uh, we see, right, social media. I always take it as a a badge of honor when students create TikTok videos from some of the activities we do together. That's the, right, that's the highest praise that they want to share it on TikTok. But obviously also um, social media is really popular. Um, if you Google Earth Optimism, or, or if you look at Instagram and Earth Optimism, you'll see several high schools that have started their own Earth Optimism Instagram feed. And we see a lot of summits either in person or online. This is a great way for students to um, take the lead and organize something with um, keynote speakers and workshops. All of these projects bring together what I call the, the sacred four Fs of working with teenagers. Um, it's gotta be free. They have to be able to bring their friends. Please have plenty of food there and it's gotta be fun. And so when students are in the driver's seat, um, you can be assured that all of those uh, criteria are being met and they're protecting the environment in the process. So thanks so much. Thanks for, um, for your attention and your great comments and questions. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, we're going to move into questions. Before we do that, I wonder if you could just briefly walk us through the collection and explain to people what's in there. So I'm going to put that link in the chat again. Um, and so right now you're looking at the Learning Lab collection. Here, let me, um, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So the first few, um, the first section here is all about Earth Optimism at the Smithsonian. So that um, you've got our, the Earth Optimism website there, um, the Instagram feed for Earth Optimism, where we share solutions and interesting stories from around the globe. Um, and then the website for this program in particular that will show you uh, lots of ideas and examples of students in action. Um, Place-based learning, again, is about um, deepening students' connection to nature. There's the two uh, place activities that we talked about. I also want to point you to um, another terrific resource at the Smithsonian, the Science Education Center. They create um, guides for global goals. These are related to the sustainable development goals. But this one in particular has an activity, for example, about community mapping, where you ask students to draw from memory um, their community and have them think about, you know, how do they access green space? And where do they congregate? And um, how do they get what they need? And what are the transportation ways? So that's a great way for students to kind of think about where there might be opportunities for intervention. And then with project-based um, learning, action planning there, you see the guide that we talked about, the criteria of questions that we ask our student groups, and then the rubric template that you can download and use uh, uh, and adapt for yourself. 
Um, and then those Venn diagrams, again, the websites are attached to those. So you can also go to Dr. Johnson's website. And then I just threw in um, just a list of a quick list off the top of my head of some of the projects that we've seen in the last three years. So um, you can just as a Kickstarter thought starter, if you want to think about um, the kinds of projects, these are all ones that we've seen at the Smithsonian, so they're real. And then in addition to this, um, in addition, right, um, the Earth Optimism Youth Action and Leadership Program has another learning lab collection that takes a little bit of a deeper dive into the case studies that I um, talked about today, the ones from Alaska, some other ones from Arkansas. So you can see what happened in each of those cities. And there's some video testimonials by the students there. Um, as in climate resilience. So I would definitely bookmark their website. The Smithsonian's Environmental Research Center has an Earth Optimism lecture series and great resources for educators, particularly as it com uh, when it comes to um, marine environments, as does the Natural History Museum at the Smithsonian. So what we've put there is their educators corner that has um, specifically some resources about how we take care of the ocean. And then, as I mentioned, right, the Smithsonian is only one player among many amazing organizations that provide climate resources. And so I've put here some of my favorites. You'll see some federal ones. The National Atmosphere, uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has amazing resources. So does the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, organizations that we work with, like um, the Wild Classroom from the World Wildlife Fund. Um, Climate Generation, Earth Force, the Wild Center, the Nature Conservancy, these are all uh, nonprofit organizations that uh, have as their goal the same thing we do, and that is um, supporting student action for the environment. Great, thank you, Jennifer. And then at the very last tile of that collection, it will be the archived uh, session of today's program. So you can find everything at that one link. So why don't we open it up to questions now? Um, we did have Gloria's question is, uh, did the Smithsonian consider a partnership affiliation directly to the universities and school districts on site as part of a program or department? Yeah, so the affiliations program, and maybe um, Philip, if you wanna put the website in the chat, if you could, um, we have over, which one for affiliation? Um, affiliation? Okay. We have over 200 Smithsonian affiliates in almost every state, um, Puerto Rico and Panama. Um, and they are not just museums. They're also science centers, universities, not school districts so much, but um, there's a variety of ways that the Smithsonian can partner. Um, so often we will partner with the school district, but through with with the help of our local affiliates. So, yes, we um, we welcome par uh, collaborators of all kinds. Great. Thank you, Philippa. <laughs> Hold on, I'm just getting it. Um, and then there was another question. Where was it? Is about the Wild Center and yes, their Youth Maddie. Climate Summit. Yes. Amazing. So, um, Maddie, as you may know, right, they've, they've been doing that for years, much longer than we have with this program. And those summits are replicated all over the world, um, which is terrific. So they have a terrific guide for creating summits um, so that any student group um, can use it to plan their own summit. And we often suggest or encourage our students to look at that, too. So yeah, there's plenty of work to be done. And so uh, we certainly like to um, promote the work of our colleagues in this space. Fabulous. I do not see any other questions. So I'd like to just thank you, Jennifer, for being here today. The work you're doing is so important. And I think I loved most of all that you said that everyone can contribute in whatever way that speaks to them. Um, and Thank you. Just, Thank you. Yeah. So, and I also want to point out our next Cultivating Learning session for December will be about using universal design for learning and digital women's history resources for accessible 
learning. And we'll focus on Emma Tenayuka. We'll have Ashley Corin from the Smithsonian American Women's History Museum. And thank you all for coming. Please feel free to reach out to us at learninglab at si.edu. And uh, we'll see you in December. And thank you, Jennifer. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone.